The most valuable applications in the world run on Oracle databases. The amount of money spent on Oracle and the processes and the people around Oracle databases is in the tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars annually. The mission critical applications that are running on Oracle need data protection. Hi everybody, this is Dave Vellante of wikibon.org. Daryl Smith is here, he's the chief database architect at EMCIT, and we're going to unpack best practices in protecting Oracle databases. Daryl, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much, good to be here. Appreciate you coming on, you're within EMCIT. We always love on theCUBE talking to the folks within EMCIT uh, because you guys have a hands-on perspective, yet at the same time, you're pretty savvy about what's going on in the marketplace. So, first of all, tell us a little bit about your role within EMCIT. Sure, I'm, uh, I'm the chief database architect for EMCIT. Uh, I'm responsible for all of our Oracle databases. As a matter of fact, I'm responsible for all the databases in the company. And that includes keeping them highly available, uh, keeping them safe, secure, uh, as well as architecting for what the next wave is going to bring. So Oracle is the leading database in the market. I mean, as I was saying in my introduction, the most mission critical ap applications are, are running on Oracle. I mean, why is that? How did Oracle to, you know, get to its hmm. prominence? Well, Oracle's been around for a long time. I actually started in Oracle back in version four uh, in 1988, um, so I've been with it for a long time. And it's really put a lot of its effort and money into R&D. And so they, they pretty much from the get-go, as far as relational databases go, have always been the market leader. Um, and they really focus on uh, the ability to handle high transactional workloads, which is really their sweet spot. Yeah, so I had mentioned as well, you know, the, the value of these applications is very high and the, and the people and processes uh, built up around the technology is substantial. So presumably protecting the data around Oracle databases is, is, is critical, but what's unique and different um, about protecting data within Oracle environments? So I think you've covered a bit of that already. Um, the data that you put into an Oracle database is generally your most mission critical, um, your highest transaction volumes, uh, which means you've got your most users there, and your uptimes are usually absolutely critical. Otherwise, why would you pay that premium? Yeah, so, okay, so it's really, um, I guess it's the impact of downtime is just greater. Uh, the impact of lost data is greater, and it's a board level impact. You might read about it in the Wall Street Journal, so it makes the stakes much, much higher. Um, talk a little bit about um, how one goes about protecting Oracle databases um, and, and the alternatives they have, but before you do, Let's assume, are we assuming a virtualized context? I mean, is, is that something that is increasingly prominent within Oracle environments, that you're virtualizing uh, the, the database of the applications? Well, that's certainly a component. Um, more and more people, more and more DBAs are virtualizing their databases. And they're doing it for a lot of reasons. One is just to get control of the costs, right? License costs for Oracle are extremely high, and so the more cores that you're running your database on, the more you're going to pay. Right. Well, there's inherent efficiencies in running it in a virtualized infrastructure, and I would take you know hours to try to explain why that is, but essentially I can get a lot more processing power out of my servers and out of my cores when I virtualize. It also adds in high availability that doesn't exist in a physical server. So because of those benefits, and obviously many more like agility, being able to stand up a database server in minutes versus days, months, weeks, years, um, you know, are all benefits as to why people are starting to virtualize. So it's, it's part of the story and it's, you know, much, but much bigger than that. So what are the choices that a customer has in terms of, of protecting <coughs> Oracle data? Right, so there's, there's all kinds of levels of protection. You know, one is obvious, um, I just need to do backups because I may need to be able to go, I may need to go back to a prior version, either because I've hit some data corruption bug within the kernel or uh, you know some bad code got out there and just made mad sense of the data. Um, I may need to do a restore. I also may need to do a restore if I don't have a business continuity plan and I lose my data center, right? And or I lose my you know server or the storage that it's residing on. Um, I may need to do a restore. So one of them is basic backup and restore capabilities, and, and this is really starting to become a challenge for people as you know as big data really hits. Our databases were big back, you know, a couple of years ago when they were two or three terabytes. Well, that's a small database today. Big databases now are 20, 30 terabytes and bigger. Um, you know, how do you continue to back that up using the same old technologies you've been using for years? Um, so, so the issue there is the backup window, right? Backup windows are getting bigger and bigger, um, and so DBAs are having to put more and more resources at it, which has a much bigger impact on the database. 
So if my database is already busy, and now I'm trying to back up a 20 terabyte database that's highly active, end users feel the pain. So in terms of choices that customers have to address that pain, I mean, RMAN is obviously uh, you know, the standard in a lot of high-end yeah, shops. Oh yeah. Um, talk about that a little bit and, and maybe some of the choices that people face. Yeah, so back in the day, you know, back before our man, um, we would have to do either cold backups or hot backups, mm -hmm. but manually, right? Write the files off to either another disk area or, or tape directly. Um, that's just not even possible anymore. So a cold backup would be like quiesce the database, take a backup? Well, then... actually, cold is shut, the di shut it down, okay. right? Then copy the files off and start it up again. Oh, so that's... Uh... That's pretty much not even an option these days. Um, a hot backup, you know, I can I can do uh, without our man by just putting the database in the hot backup mode and copying the files off. We've kind of taken that one and put a little twist on it. We actually um, can either put the database in the hot backup mode or not, but with TimeFinder snaps um, on both our, our VMAX and VNX series uh, storage arrays, I can take a clone of that those data files instantly. So whether I put the database in hot backup mode or not, I actually am not required to, um, I can take a backup uh, in about 30 seconds and then write that off to a completely different set of disks and the database is right back up and running. So, so I, uh, in that completely different set of disks could be on-site or even off-site, right? That's ideal. Well, if I'm, if, ideally, if I'm doing a snapshot um, or a clone, I'm doing it within the storage array, so I'm in the same data center. Yeah. But literally, I could do the same functionality with um, Recover Point, which could be in the data center or could be replicating elsewhere. <clears throat> you could also do it with any of our, you know, uh, replication technologies like Vplex or SRDF, and actually do your backup on the DR side. So the hot backup that you described is still manual. Our man automates that, right? Talk about that a little bit. Right. So our man is really kind of the glue that holds it all together and makes things much easier for us. Our man has features like compression, multi-threading, um, which allows us to uh, back up a database, you know, with many more threads running and not have to worry about you know, which uh, data files I've gotten and trying to balance that load across different threads. Our main handles all that for you and gives you a catalog uh, which is intelligent and knows exactly when your backups were, which archive files are required to restore it up to what point in time. Um, so it's a very automated way of doing it. Uh, most third-party backup applications actually tie into our main. And so while you've got a backup repository in your third-party tool, like Networker, for instance, is what one we have, um, you also have the RMAN catalog. So when we talk to practitioners within the Wikibon community, they tell us, and it depends who you talk to, the CIOs, they want to you know, align with their IT, they want to drive business value, they want to manage their risk. When we talk to the infrastructure people, they want to obviously cut their costs, they want to make sure that they're, they're, they're leveraging infrastructure across as many applications as possible in the portfolio. When you talk to the application heads, they just want to make sure they're meeting service levels and they're getting the right performance. So right. There's, there's this kind of inherent tension between the objectives that some of those different you know, roles have, particularly as it relates to storage management and backup. Can you talk about some of the DBAs and the storage admins and some of the organizational nuances that, that are involved there and how you guys are addressing some of those? Sure, in backup space specifically, um, Data Domain has a storage appliance which has deduplication built into it as well as compression. And so typically when we're trying to back up to a, a, another disk array, um, what happens is the, the, the owners of the storage admins that own that disk array uh, are trying to always push back and say, hey, don't take as many backups, I don't have that much storage. And so it leads to us having to do like our main incremental backups, um, which can be painful or could be actually be catastrophic when you try and restore those back, right? I have to restore back uh, a backup that I did a week ago and then I have to restore a bunch of incrementals or do a, an incremental merge. And that doesn't always work and sometimes I actually can't get a backup done. With data domain, um, I can make, take full backups every single day, and the only difference in storage is the difference of the data rate change for that day. But it also includes compression on the fly. And so I actually have backed up a 13 terabyte database, uh, and it took three terabytes uh, on the first backup, and then it added another 300 gig on the backup the next day. I mean, literally, you're reducing that storage down to a bare minimum. Okay, so talk a little bit about, uh, you're starting to discuss some of the best practice. So, so what are some of the best practice considerations that you guys have applied within EMCIT that you might share with some of your fellow practitioners? Sure, um, one of the ones, one of the practices that we do on our most mission critical, highly active databases is one that a lot of people 
once they hear it, are actually go out and start implementing it. And I talked about how I can take a backup by simply uh, taking a TimeFinder clone. Well, I can actually mount that clone up on another proxy server. That could be a physical server or just another VM. And then I can back that up using RMAN to my data, uh, my data domain or wherever my, my backup storage is. And, and I can do that without any impact at all of a production database. So even if I've got a highly active 20 terabyte database, 30 seconds to take my backup, and then I can take as long as I want um, to actually back that up to my, my backup media, up to and including running it as fast as like eight terabyte an hour. Um, which, which as you say, could be on site, it could be off site. How do you how do you guys actually manage that? I mean, obviously you're doing some stuff on yeah. site, but off site as well. Yeah. Maybe talk about that a little bit. Um, so I like to keep my backups local. Um, obviously, compliance uh, people as well as uh, you know the business likes to make sure their backups get off site. Now, why do you like to keep them local? Just because they're there and it's faster to recover. Well, if I ever need to recover them, <laughs> um, it's a heck of a lot faster if it's local than if I have to either you know drag it over the wire that's 600 miles away or you know, call up Iron Mountain or something and have them bring the tapes back. And yeah, and, 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 and most of your recoveries is just presumably correct, is for reasonably fresh data? Yes. Yeah, yeah generally, you're, if you're doing a recovery, it's something that happened in the last 24 hours. Right. Um, it, it's rare that you would have to restore something that's older than that, um, although that is certainly possible, and generally that's a, a compliance question or, a, uh, you know, I need to do some surgical restore. I've accidentally deleted data that was from last quarter. Um, but all of those are fairly simple, especially when you add in that proxy server. Um, but let me get back to first getting the data offsite. Right? Okay. I like it local, but I need it offsite. I use the data domain replication that actually replicates that data behind the scenes to my business continuity site. So I've got my backup now in two different locations. And if I use uh, a product like DD Boost, RMAN, the RMAN catalog is actually the one that controls that replication. So my RMAN catalog knows about both locations. So I could restore from my DR site, or I could restore from my production site. And then you even, you mentioned tape before. At, 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 at that point, do you go to tape? Do you, do you offload, you know, and stick it in an Iron Mountain somewhere, and just, just, in, just, in, just in case? So you could, <laughs> I suppose. Um, but given the deduplication and the fact that I'm only storing the data rate changes, I can easily store like a year's worth of backups um, in that data domain without taking up very much space at all. It doesn't really help me to get rid of that, that old, old version. Now, obviously, we need to do yearly saves um, for compliance reasons. That we do back up to tape and send that off-site, but I don't ever expect to have to retrieve that. So that's deep archive that you never want to see again, probably. Correct. Uh, if you do, then you're, yeah, you're pulling some all-nighters. <laughs> yeah, a lot of all-nighters, and I don't like those very much. Uh, okay, how about maybe uh, describe the environment a little bit more inside of EMC IT in terms of what you guys are doing, how you're applying, you know, Oracle and, and protecting Oracle. Just sure. Share, paint a picture for us. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about backup. What we really haven't talked about is availability, um, which is another way that you need to protect your database. Can you, be af can you afford to be down or have that database down for four hours or eight hours or 48 hours? That's just not possible, and, and that's not protecting your Oracle data. Um, so you need some sort of high availability, which is why people have moved to Rack. Right, Oracle Rack is a very, very good technology of keeping an active, active copy of your database up and running. But in general, people don't need Oracle Rack uh, to have something that's always available. Right, that's really kind of a fallacy. Most of our big Oracle Rack databases have you know two to three hour outages because by Oracle Rack. Uh, what most of the databases really need is they need that ability to come back within you know three to five minutes. You know, the database goes down, the server blows up, I have a fire in the data center. I want to get that database up as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and five minutes is pretty darn quick. And so that's where virtualization comes in. That lets me have high availability of my single instance database. So I'm protected out of the box with just a VMware virtualization solution without having to go into that very expensive, very complicated uh, product of Oracle Rack. So I want to change the topics a little bit and talk about external customers. I mean, EMC, like many IT companies, but EMC is particularly astute at this will trot out its best IT practitioners and talk to talk to other IT practitioners, you know, ostensibly sure. customers of EMC or, or potential customers of EMC. I presume you're one of the spokespeople to do that. Talk about those activities, what you're hearing from customers. Where does where does the EMC Salesforce use Daryl Smith and, uh, and leverage your knowledge and what kind of discussions are you having with customers? Yeah, unfortunately they leverage me just a little bit too much. <laughs> um, but I do speak to a lot of customers and these are you know, not only our big customers but also our small customers. 
they not only like to know what EMC internally is doing, you know, how we're using our products, um, they also like to know just how a large uh, Oracle shop does it. Um, so I speak to customers in what's called our, our executive briefing center. And I also speak with customers over like WebEx uh, um, meetings, uh, as well as just regular you know, conference call meetings. Um, sometimes they tell me their problems and I give them how we, would, how we solve those. Um, so I speak with customers all the time. And, and you know, they have several complaints, um, and not necessarily with EMC. Uh, you know, they're all trying to solve the same problem that we are with Oracle, right? How do I protect my data? How do I reduce my licensing costs? How do I get an efficient use out of my, my infrastructure, whether that be storage or you know, CPU or you, know, you name it? Um, how do I efficiently use that storage, push it you know, to the limit, um, and yet protect my, my business? Yeah, and they're resource constrained. I mean, you pointed out, I mean, <laughs> Aren't we, we all? And we've, we, and we've quantified the, the impact of you know, Oracle licenses. It's right. expensive and licenses and maintenance. We've also done some work in terms of just evaluating how to balance out the system to actually reduce the number of cores that you have yeah. so that you can you can actually reduce your, your your licenses maybe spend a little bit more on storage maybe even add some flash right to balance the system reduce the impact of the number of cores that you need and enhance the ripple through effect to your your license costs have you guys played around with that uh, absolutely guys, and, yeah. and that was a great blog article um, you know you even mentioned memory yeah right the simple addition right. of memory can reduce my CPU consumption, right? Thereby also reducing the number of cores that I need, right? It's all about trying to, to offload that kind of work um, away from the CPUs that you have to license in, into something else. Um, so, you know, that was a great article. Uh, and we play with that all the time, which is one of the reasons why, you know, we have uh, extensively tested VMware and, and found all the different knobs and buttons that you can push or twist or pull um, to get you that native performance that you would get, um, you know, w without the virtualization. Um, you, know, you know, this in-memory trend, since you mentioned it, is is kind of interesting. Um, it, but in-memory databases have been around since you know databases have been around times ten. <laughs> yeah. Been around for a long time. And and yet at the same time, prices are coming down. You know, memories are getting larger. Um, and but you still got to be able to protect that data that's in memory. So what yep. are you guys? What are you seeing in terms of that in-memory trend? How are you exploiting it? And and how are you protecting that data? Yeah, well, um, there, you know, there's a lot of new in-memory database players, right? Um, SAP put out HANA. Yep. Um, they're actually looking at virtualizing HANA, which I think would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, VMware also has SQL Fire. I'm sorry, it used to be VMware. Now it's Pivotal Labs. It has SQL Fire, which is an in-memory database, right. which then persists to some storage. That storage could be uh, a flat file system, not really a great idea, or it could be another mm -hmm. database back end. Mm -hmm. um, we actually do... Um, our, our integration layer that we have, we have a common integration layer throughout all of the EMC um, uh, applications. And that runs with uh, uh, you know, a SQL Fire uh, front end, which persists to an Oracle back end. And the reason that we persist it to an Oracle back end is really all about that data protection. Right? We um, you know, are able to replicate that database you know, 600 miles away with a zero data loss um, very easily, and it's something that we feel very comfortable with. And so, you know, a lot of times, and, and I really think it's best practice, is use that in-memory database as a front end to some other database. Mm -hmm. And literally, if that uh, memory database is doing all the work, then maybe your back-end database doesn't actually need to be that hefty. So I'm starting to play around with doing that same kind of workload with a SQL Fire, the in-memory database, persisting to a Postgres database. Uh, okay. And getting great results. So a lighter weight back-end um, right. that's maybe... <laughs> You know, less expensive, more efficient. Um, how do you see Flash playing all this? Do you see sort of Flash as adding another layer, or do you see over time those layers you know, collapsing, sort of, you know, uh, high performance, you know, tier zero, and then a bit bucket? What do you What do you yeah, expect? <laughs> um, so Flash is definitely making a huge play here. Um, I mean, there's there's Flash products from you know all Flash arrays. Uh, Extreme IO is one of the MCs. Uh, which is coming out, I believe, in Q4 of this year. November, um, I think, yeah. November, right. Yeah, it's, which is a phenomenal product. I've been playing around with it in my lab. I'm, I'm migrating it into my data center. I'm going to get it in there before we even go GA with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's extremely fast, and it's got built-in deduplication. Right. So Flash is expensive. Um, regardless, if you're trying to build an all-Flash array, you're going to spend some big bucks. But if I can, I can utilize that deduplication ability, I can have my, my production, my development, my test, all in the same array, still get great performance, yet 
basically only use the amount of space that, that production would use. Right? Dev and test are kind of free. Um, but when you know when you're talking about flash, again, you're offloading resources that would be um, utilizing CPU resources that would be utilized in wait states for I/O. You're you're removing those, right? So you're you're going to use a lot less CPU, as well as get your data back faster. But again, as I said, all flash arrays are very expensive. It's much cheaper to put stuff in a bit bucket. So if I can have multi tiers uh, within a single storage array, I can really help to reduce the cost, right? That's one of the, the um, products that we have, which is called FastVP, uh, which automatically migrates that data behind the scenes uh, into the appropriate tier. If it's data that doesn't get used often, it goes down to that bit bucket running on SATA drives. Um, if it gets used sometimes, it'll go up into the fiber channel, which is our traditionally high performing, um, you know, disk, magnetic disk. And then if it's really, really random and, and is used a lot, then it's going to go up into the flash area. So it lets you make a more efficient use of that flash. All right, uh, Daryl, let's bring it back. I'll give you the last word uh, to, to data protection and, and Oracle. So, a uh, piece of advice, you know, to practitioners. They're struggling with, with, with backup windows. Uh, they're trying to keep their costs down. They're drowning in Oracle license and maintenance costs. What's the, what's the one thing that you would advise your fellow practitioners in this area that are, that are struggling with this problem? So when it comes to backups um, and, and you know, uh, backup windows that just keep growing, you need to do something about that. Um, you know, you, you could go the traditional route and look at trying to do like RMN uh, incremental backups, uh, but your better bet is really go look at Data Domain. Data Domain has a product called DD Boost, which only pushes across the wire um, those bits that have changed, and it can really make your database backup run a lot, lot faster with a lot fewer resources both on the production server as well as in the network, as well as the, the back-end um, um, back media. Uh, and then there's also the what I talked about earlier where you offload those backups. Um, I mean, we have, like I said, 20 terabyte databases, which we back up in 30 seconds. No mm -hmm. CPU uh, utilized on that production server. All right, so those are both good options. Anything you would do differently if you had to take this journey again? Ask for more money. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, well, we've certainly learned a lot along the way. Um, you know, we took a lot of lumps in the beginning. Um, it would have been great to know what these best practices were before I started, mm -hmm. or even you know, shortly after we started. And so, uh, in order to prevent other people from having to experience that pain, we've published all those best practices, and you can find them uh, up on a, a site that EMC has, which is called uh, Communities. The Communities at EMC. And you can just get to it, you could Google everything Oracle at EMC, or you could go to communities.emc.com and there's an everything, or everything Oracle at EMC group there. And we publish a lot of our best practices there, you know, including the, the backup stuff we talked about, as well as how, how to virtualize. Um, you know, I've written plenty of blogs on you know, all of the best practices in virtualization, how to get native performance. So you know, there's, there's nothing I probably that I could have done differently uh, but I would certainly have liked to have learned from me uh, back when I started. Yeah, there's, um, there's some good resources definitely on the mc.com. You guys do a really good job, I think, of, of testing out various solutions and configurations. It's a great fee freebie. I always tell customers, take advantage of it. Yeah. Daryl Smith, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. It's great you. to see you. All right, everybody, thanks for watching. This is Dave Vellante from wikibon.org. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's continuous production where we go out to the events, we bring the experts in, we extract the signal from the noise. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.